So have you ever spoken to a journalist before? No, it's first time. How does that make you feel? Oh, weird, strange. It's not scary. But just have to be careful what we say. I'm going to call this man Wolf. I can't tell you his actual name. And in fact, I can't tell you a lot of things about him. That's because he's an active spy. In other words, he pretends to be a criminal for a living. He works for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and even NGOs as an undercover agent, infiltrating both drug cartels and wildlife trafficking syndicates. The reason I've come to find Wolf is because he's the guy who was tasked with pulling off the impossible, bringing down one of East Africa's most wanted wildlife traffickers, Moazu Kroma. He's the kingpin you heard about in our first episode, who Ugandan investigators found in a house with more than a ton of ivory. This is my first time meeting Wolf, but I've already heard a lot about him. He was a scary-looking, intimidating dude. Well, not to say it in a bad way, but I thought this guy's got some big balls. So, along with my producers, Saskia and Mao, I finally was able to make my own impression of Wolf when we met in his hometown and were greeted very warmly. This is Renaka, the presenter. Hi. Hey. I'm happy to meet you. And for sure, scary looking dude is accurate. He has everything from the bad boy starter pack. He's ripped, wearing a Harley Davidson top, and his look gives Vin Diesel stunt double. And perhaps Big Balls is accurate too. Within seconds of finding out how much we're paying for our ride from the airport, he's in a screaming match with a taxi driver. What do you think that was about? Apparently he took us the long way and overcharged us. I'm thinking to myself, that was intense. Oh. And inside him truly lives two wolves, because just as quickly as the anger came, it disappeared. After nearly coming to fisticuffs over what would amount to about 20 US dollars, from the window of our hotel lobby, we see Wolf and the driver embrace. Very no, no, they're hugging now. Okay. Yeah. So we pay the controversial extra 20 bucks. That's fine. And then we head out because I have many questions for Wolf. I want to know how he embarked upon bringing Chroma down but also who he is. So the question I start with is, what does an undercover get up to on their downtime? The answer, working out. We head to a boxing session with his trainer. So is he a good boxer? He's getting better. <laughs> uh, we look at him, he looks a rude guy, but he's very humble. Then Wolf's trainer tells us about their motto. We have a, a way of uh, saying it. It's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. Meaning, if you're a warrior doing gardening, hey, you might not be entering the Chelsea Flower Show, but you can still garden okay. But if you're a landscaper caught in a war, you're dead. So basically it's about preparing. A warrior is ready for the most extreme, the worst case, a war, because they know it will inevitably come. Okay, you don't want to do a round? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm intimidated by this, and I can't lie. <laughs> and Wolf has been in plenty of battles, like the one we've come to talk to him about. See, Mwazu Kuroma was eventually arrested and prosecuted, and Wolf's the main reason this trafficker once considered untouchable, wound up in a jail cell in New York. The same Chroma who so many feared was above the law. He was locked up. I know that seems like a spoiler, but after investigating this case, the fact that Mwazu Chroma was taken out is nowhere near as interesting as how he was taken out and by who. It involved governments across continents and NGOs and spies and unwitting Kenyan and Ugandan citizens. And it reveals so much about the universe of wildlife trafficking, which I began to realize is a beast of its own. 
spreading its tentacles across the world, locking animals and ecosystems and people in a global chokehold. I came to meet Wolf to help me begin to piece together how this elaborate, complex and frankly audacious operation went down. So from the teams at Luminary, Dream Crew and Novel, I'm Renaco Selina, and this is episode two of The Wildlife. And we're calling it The Big Bad Wolf. Oh! <laughs> It became clear there was someone else I needed to talk to in order to map the course of the Chroma case. He's the definition of straight-laced. The kind of guy who I imagine would have such perfectly polished shoes he could look at them and see the reflection of his perfectly manicured crew cut. I'm talking about Wolf's handler, his manager basically, Wim Brown. I'm a retired DEA agent. We got in touch with Wim and he said he'd tell us about the unlikely series of events that led to both him and Wolf becoming entangled in the Chroma case. The pair have worked together for years. The alias Wolf apparently came about because he's notoriously good at hunting down people. But Wim told me that he has his own nickname for Wolf. You know, one of the times I would call him Superman because I'm kind of like the Superman as well because I have a little Superman tattoo that's right here. Wim's pointing to his peck. He got tatted with another agent he trained with at the iconic Quantico Virginia Academy. And then I think my mom came to visit me like two months later and she says, ah, my mom was from the Netherlands. She goes, ah, I love these stick-on tattoos. And she's rubbing it. She goes, ah, Fladoma. She's like, this is not a stick-on tattoo. This is, I thought your sister would do this, but never you. I call it my stupid man tattoo now. (laughs) Superman or stupid man? Wim is no bum. He's got years of experience with undercover operations. And he's worked in the DEA's most elite units. His best-known case is probably the takedown of Russian arms dealer, Victor Boot. If you've heard of Victor Boot, there are probably two reasons why. One. The man the U.S. swapped with Russia in exchange for the release of WNBA star Brittany Griner. Or. Selling guns is like selling vacuum cleaners. You make calls, pound the pavement. I supplied every army but the Salvation Army. There was a movie that was made that was supposed to be about Victor Boot, Lord of War, with Nicolas Cage. Say what you like about warlords and dictators. They always pay their bills on time. I would tell you to go to hell, but I think you're already there. It was this kind of experience, getting arms dealer Victor Boot arrested in an intricate undercover sting. It's those kind of operations that made Wim one of the best in his line of work. So, by 2016, Wim was dispatched on a new challenge. The DEA sent him to work in Kenya. He was what's called an attaché, in his case, for East Africa. In essence, he was stationed in the US Embassy in Nairobi and was responsible for investigating crimes that fall under the DEA's remit there. Like drug trafficking happening in East Africa, linked back to the US. In the minute you get into Kenya, you start to see the overlaps between the drug trafficking, the weapons trafficking, and especially in this case, the illicit wildlife trafficking. To translate, what Wim was seeing was that criminals in East Africa weren't just selling guns or heroin, for example. The same criminals were also trafficking ivory or rhino horn. So in order to look into these crossovers... The DEA developed the Wildlife Crime Unit First up, when he started his stint as an attaché, was a sort of spaghetti-at-the-wall approach. He sent an undercover agent out to start talking to people, meeting drug and maybe wildlife traffickers, to start doing small deals. Networking, basically, and gathering information to figure out who the big syndicates and players are, important targets to focus on. And so, Wim's like, this calls for one of his best agents. This calls for the wolf. He was the kind of guy that I could send in who could go and meet with anybody. And people were attracted to him. When I sat down and spoke to Wolf, he told me, basically, you can plonk him anywhere. And his friendliness mixed with his hulking frame. Well, criminals gravitate towards him, like moths to a flame. If I sit down anywhere, 
Some guy will come to me and sell me drugs. Do you think it's your luck? <laughs> I don't know. I might have a magnet for that or something. I don't know. I sit somewhere and people come to sell me ivory or pangolins or drugs or cocaine. How do you respond? I say, yes, I want, but big amounts. <laughs> like I said, Wolf is a natural. And that might be because, well, as I found out, it's not like Wolf is a stranger to shady scenes. Before he was an undercover agent, he was a different kind of agent. And I hope you can hear the quotation marks in my voice there. He was an agent for strippers. I had 35 strippers working for me when 21 years old. And I charged for the clubs to pay me for the dancers. Do you think that early experience led you or helped you in what you do now, anyway? Maybe. Maybe being smart, dealing with some difficult things. Sometimes, like, they call and say, Oh, we want five girls. You get there and there's, like, plates of cocaine, drinks, pills, girls. So you are in that world. So Wolf is used to operating in society's underbelly. But he's also a professional who's been doing undercover work for over a decade. So Wim brought him over to Kenya and told him to turn on his criminal magnet. He said, search for drug targets. But always have in mind for ivory deals. So same time I was searching for drug targets, I was searching for ivory targets. Just imagine, Wolf out there, doing what he does best, sniffing around, hunting. Well, actually, we don't have to imagine. Test, one, two, three, tests, one, two, three, tests. Because we have Wolf's recordings of this time, and of the entire Coroma case. Hey. Are you ready to do things, too? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Man. You ready? These are usually only available to the US government. A huge cache, an unprecedented insight into how these cases go down, blow by blow. Even Wim doesn't have access to all these recordings. Let's do business again, big one. I come ready to do business with you, big one. These recordings are a fascinating peek into how the illegal wildlife trade actually works from the inside and how Wolf operates when he's undercover, the character he took on. What was your cover story? I live in Senegal. I mainly do drugs. But I have uh, some Chinese contacts that uh, sometimes they're interested in buying some ivory. So it's a bonus for me. Make more money. Here he is, trying that story out while on the job. And I only deal with drugs, cocaine. And in my business, I met some people from Asia. And they told me that they were needing uh, this product. So I've never been in this side, working. Wolf was trying to climb the wildlife and drug trafficking ladder. He was repeating this cover story to whoever would listen and making deals where he could, all on Wim's instruction. And slowly, he was building up a picture of the trafficking scene in Kenya. It's kind of funny to imagine that there are spies out there, right now, basically on fishing expeditions. In 2016, Wolf's goal was to eventually zero in on the big players, but he was starting from scratch. And he would spend months at a time in Kenya, over years, doing meeting after meeting after meeting. And we have hundreds of these recordings, which range from hostile... If I meet Abu... And I tell Abu that I paid money to these guys to meet him. He will not be happy. To flat out boring. <laughs> While others teeter on the absurd. Like when Wolf is trying to close a heroin deal at a bar, but you can barely hear the recording over a techno mashup of ABBA. Because if I was to tell him that particular thing, that was going to disturb our heads. Yet, I'm there to help. I just this met so mind. many people. I don't know, I met like 500 people. But then he stumbled across someone. Oh. Good morning. <laughs> I'm fine. This someone called Aaliyah. She's my angel. Okay, I call you. I'm here. We're here together. Don't worry. <laughs> 
Wolf met Aaliyah through an informant of the police unit from Kenya. She was before mm, linked to drugs, selling small amounts, you know, grams and whatever. But she also knew she knew many people related to the, the ivory. Wolf didn't know it yet, but it was Aaliyah who would be the first link in a chain reaction ultimately leading to the takedown of Mwazu Koroma. Don't rush. <laughs> no, I don't rush. Slowly. Watch there. Left. Watch right. Yes. Yeah. Listen there. Listen there. Then you move. But I'm sure we're going to succeed. So Wolf was in Kenya, starting to fill up his Rolodex of drug and wildlife criminals. But in the periphery, there were other major events, moves, policies swirling. Around this time, the US was ramping up their interest in fighting the illegal wildlife trade around the world. President Barack Obama had made a massive statement, an executive order, saying that poaching and the illegal wildlife trade was an international crisis that was continuing to escalate, and that it was fueling instability and spreading zoonotic diseases. And crucially for this story, Obama's order said, The United States shall seek to assist those governments in anti-wildlife trafficking activities when requested by foreign nations experiencing trafficking of protected wildlife. Basically, if you're a country that has a problem with wildlife trafficking, the US is here to help. So another agency was given more funding and powers to investigate. The Fish and Wildlife Service. My name's Sam Freiberg. I'm a retired special agent with Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, before I started out on this story, I thought I pretty much knew what fish and wildlife did. Astride a horse, definitely wearing a wide-brimmed hat, stopping people from hunting deer or fishing or something in American national parks. And they do do that stuff. But they also have a small group of agents who work undercover, focusing on wildlife criminals, though without the massive budgets and publicity of agencies like the DEA or the FBI. You know, probably have the uh, the worst equipment, have the least amount of resources, but make the biggest impact. Fish and wildlife, they've always done undercover cases. Here are a couple of examples. Fish and wildlife went undercover to take down the Irish gang, the Rathkeel Rovers. They were trafficking rhino horn through the United States. They did the same thing with a syndicate in the U.S. that was selling body parts of big cats. And Sam was drawn to this area of the agency. If Wolf's talent was for reeling in criminal actors, and Wim's talent was for masterminding complicated stings like with Victor Boot, Sam's was for compiling undercover evidence necessary to prosecute big-time criminals. It's exciting. It's some of the best evidence when you have a video or an audio where they're admitting certain crimes. It's undeniable. But, you know, you got to avoid entrapment, and there's all these rules that, as a law enforcement officer, you just got to be careful or your case will be no good. What was it about this kind of work that interested you the most? For sure, it it was uh, targeting higher-level criminal networks. Despite Fish and Wildlife being a relatively small agency, you know what they say, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And... Sam's a tenacious guy with the grit and vocal fry of a bulldog. And he sharpened his teeth for undercover work in Alaska. But a few years after Obama's executive order, Sam traded in Juneau for the Tanzanian city Dar es Salaam. He became an East Africa attaché, like Wim. My goal going over there was to help the Tanzanians, help the Ugandans, help the Kenyans, Malawians, the other countries I covered to work on wildlife trafficking, to catch bad guys. There was one thing that came to mind when I heard this. Major Captain America vibes. I didn't quite get, why is this any of the U.S.'s business? Like, why is the U.S. concerned with what's going on with wildlife in East Africa? Why do you think there was such a great impetus or like drive from the U.S. side to be involved in shutting things down. 
a lot of the the money behind this comes through U.S. banks. And so I think that's where we have some teeth to help put a stop to it. I mean, there is trade coming into USA. U.S. is one of the countries that rates pretty high on wildlife trade. Why USA, why attaches? U.S. Fish and Wildlife has the digital lab. We have the forensic lab. We have great training capabilities that we can take those abroad and, and help other countries countries out. This answer didn't totally satisfy me, but it's the justification for why Sam was sent there. He was in Tanzania training a team of local law enforcement agents on ways to take down wildlife traffickers. And after some months of working in East Africa, something happened that was pretty astonishing and very similar to what was going on in Uganda with Mwazu Kroma. I'm talking about what you heard in episode one, when Cromer was first arrested with all that ivory. So let me take you to this moment in June of 2016. Sam was in Dar es Salaam. On that day, I, I got a call from the leader of the team that his team members had made an arrest and seizure of a bunch of ivory at a storage house. He asked if I could come and, and take a look. When we were driving through, I was, it was kind of nerve-wracking because it's a, it's a shady part of Dar es Salaam. It's a rough-and-tumble part of town. I was brought into this house, and it was just an empty house. Nothing else other than ivory stacked everywhere. Every closet, every room had ivory stacked up in it. Couldn't believe it. It was very sad to see it. I think it was over 666 pieces of elephant ivory. Deja vu with the Chroma case, no? This one became known as the 666 case. Had you ever seen anything like it in that house? No, that was my first uh, eyes on a, that amount of ivory. It was still the biggest amount I've seen up close and personal. You know, blood still on the tusks, all that. You know, it kind of hit home that you know, this is why... I'm here, and this is what, you know, I'm here to help these folks try to put a stop to. At least six people were arrested that day, and 1.4 tons of ivory was seized. I just remember talking to the team members and high-fiving them because they, they made a really good arrest. It was an exciting moment. That much ivory, we knew it had to lead to bigger stockpiles. At the time, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to lead to the bad guys that we ended up pursuing the years after, but I just had a good feeling. Along with the ivory, they also seized computers and phones and started looking through the massive amount of evidence on them. But combing through stacks of evidence is Sam's thing. And Sam has a name for when he hits a great clue. He calls it a gold nugget. When you hit a gold nugget, it's just as you're starting to put the case together. And that's where, where it becomes rewarding. So Sam is out there prospecting for golden nuggets of information. Nuggets that could help nail down where this ivory came from. Who was responsible? Who was masterminding this? And getting rich off it. This included talking with two of the people arrested at the property with the ivory. And in their testimonies and in the phones, Sam kept seeing a name. Amara Sharif. Amara Sharif. They discovered that he was a man originally from Guinea and in his early 50s. The name came up, I believe, in some of the interviews done. You know, the golden nuggets are the texting back and forth with instructions or money sent, tele-money type of transactions. It became clear. The man behind this enormous blood-stained hall of ivory in Dar es Salaam it was him, Sharif. Sam felt they had enough evidence to say, Amara Sharif is running the show. He appeared to be operating his wildlife syndicate out of Tanzania. But by the time they'd figured this out, he'd already fled the country. So then came a big statement. Amara Sharif was placed on Interpol's red notice list. After that case, they put him on the red list. Yep. It was a big deal to get him on that list. It's the closest thing to an international arrest warrant in use today. 
Sharif would have to look over his shoulder all around the world. But he was still at large, and quite possibly still trafficking ivory and rhino horn. They knew who he was, but they hadn't found a way to stop him. But then, remember Wolf and Aaliyah, the well-connected source in Kenya? Working with her would open doors for Wolf, bringing his usual criminal-attracting powers to new heights. She helped me a lot. I can give to her 50% of my success. This is where crime boss Mwazu Koroma in Uganda, Wolf's searching for poachers in Kenya, and Sam's discovery of Amara Sharif's ivory in Tanzania, all these disparate puzzle pieces intersect, snap together, and bring into focus an enormous international, multi-pronged wildlife trafficking empire. To me, it's an amazing story because I would have never guessed in my career that it would have happened this way, but it did. So the angelic Aaliyah, the wildlife and drug trafficker Aaliyah, Starting in 2016, Wolf began spending time with her, obviously not telling her about his real job as an undercover. Same story. I'm a drug dealer from Senegal, but my clients in Asia have uh, interest in some ivory. Do you know any people who can help me supply and ship out? So she said yes. They began doing little deals here and there, Aliyah getting a commission. She helped me with everything. All these introductions of these guys, she worked hard. I was helping her financially also. Wolf was also trying to cultivate a reputation as a reliable ivory buyer in trafficking circles. And Aaliyah was his connection to sellers. So he had to do more than just give her money. He had to form a bond, trust with her. Listen. Yeah. This, this is a gift for your daughter. Thank you very much. Just go down with your daughter and come back again. Okay. And the plan worked. They got close. She opened up to him, talking about how she was doing illegal ivory deals for her daughter's future, so she could train and one day become a heavy machinery operator. My daughter went to bulldozer. The tractors, who she want, that is the college she went. It was all working fine. But Wolf couldn't keep networking at this level, buying these morsels of ivory indefinitely. The DEA needed to close in on someone worth investigating, someone who's running a big operation, who had enough clout and money that they've corrupted port officials who were supposed to block dodgy shipments being sent to the US. Because if the American government was going to take down a trafficker, they needed to be able to show that this person was sending illegal products to the US. That's the only way they had jurisdiction. But Wolf kept hitting dead ends. So when I started to push for bigger amounts, transportation to other countries, have a buyer in New York, the small porches couldn't do nothing, you know? Because it was just killing and selling small amounts of ivory. First thing now, talk with the right people who can control the ports that can help us to put the things out of the port. You can hear Wolf's frustration in these recordings. People are just shrugging, like, I can get you some ivory, but I can't transport internationally. I just need help in the port, okay? They don't have nothing to do with my business. But then things changed gear. That's when Aaliyah introduced Wolf to people who started talking about... They'll say Big Boss. They always spoke about someone that was capable of helping me. He is the top guy who can help me to do that. He's the biggest guy who can help me to do that. Two people. There's a big boss, there's a big boss. A big boss is what Wolf has been looking for. And not just Wolf. It's the kind of target Wim was brought to East Africa to close in on. The kind of target Sam was determined to take down. You're targeting the heads of organizations and the objective is to take off the head, disrupt it, dismantle it. That makes a huge impact. Initially, it was just whispers of this big boss. But eventually, the big boss appeared. One of the poachers brought me Mansur. Mansur Mohammed Sarur. 
a then 56-year-old Kenyan man. And when Wolf got in contact with him, the tone of the conversations completely changed. Yeah. He knows everyone, big people. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Very, very, very man, big people. Okay, my friend. Behind the scenes, Wolf's handler, Wim, was listening to his undercover recordings. Then finally, when you start listening to the recording and you're like, well, wait a second, this guy seems serious. Here's a senior guy, older guy, and he starts talking about his relationships that he had with people within the government of Kenya from way back in the day. If he is a politician, he's a famous guy, yeah? You can do business with him, with him with no problem. Uh, okay, and he's famous people at the highest level of the government, family members, 10 years back, then were involved in the poaching, right? And now when you start running the name and you're talking to some of your counterparts, they're like, this is for real. Mansour seemed like the real deal, the kind of guy who mixed with corrupt politicians. But while Wolf was chatting to Mansour, he kept going on about someone else really well connected, even better than he is. He didn't say exactly who it was. But then, according to Wolf, a name slipped out. So in the middle of the conversations, he told me by phone that he has to speak with Skoma. I don't know who Skoma. So I do record, phone call record, and just upload. The name Chroma didn't ring any bells for Wolf, but it did mean something to Wim. So you can imagine how his ears perked up when he was listening to this recording from Wolf. In the middle of the meeting, he says, Hey, Chroma. And he says the name. Wim knew about Moazu Chroma's initial arrest in Uganda in connection with that massive haul of ivory. The arrest you heard about from investigators Rex and Vincent Opiene. And Wim knew that since being released on bail, Chroma was still at large and still dealing in illegal wildlife products. Wim immediately picked up the phone. And he called me in the night and say, hey man, you just hit the jackpot. What jackpot? <laughs> just listen to what he says in the call. He's going to call Koma. You know who's Koma? I said, I don't know who's Koma. Go to the internet. See, this is a big guy. This is what we're searching him for years. Uganda also fell into Sam Freiberg's remit as the fish and wildlife attaché for East Africa. And Sam had been keeping tabs on Chroma too. So I was hearing about uh, Chroma, his involvement with wildlife trafficking. The Ugandan investigators Sam was in touch with were upset that the legal case against Chroma appeared to be falling apart. They suspected it was simple corruption, that Chroma had bribed people to stay out of prison. Chroma had become almost the object of obsession for Ugandan agents. He was a guy who seemed to slip away from justice constantly, like he was coated in Teflon. But now, it looked like there might be another avenue to bring him down, through Wolf. Then we start to push for meetings with Koma. Eventually, Chroma agrees to meet Wolf, along with Mansour. It's early discussions to feel out what kind of deal they might do. And while they're meeting, Chroma won't shut up about another guy. Every time he speaks, he says, have to speak with Amara. Now I have to talk with Amara. And who the hell is Amara? (laughs) Amara, Amara, Amara. Amara Sharif. Wolf and Wim were hearing the name Amara Sharif for the first time and wondering to themselves, who is this guy? So, Wim's like, I'll ask my fellow attaché, Sam Freiberg. At that moment, Sam was getting his morning caffeine hit, while on a trip back to the US, Idaho to be exact. I'm sitting here at the coffee shop with my coffee. I think I had a cinnamon bun, you know, here I am in USA. I'm on my computer. I'm just engaged, totally focused, and I get a quick text from Wim saying, are you around? And do you know these people? And he sent Sharif's name in a photo. And I called him and I was just like, yeah, what's going on? Wim was telling me that he's got an undercover who is engaged in conversation with Mansoor, who's introduced him to Sharif. And that I was just like, no way. This is huge. 
I'm like, Wim, this guy is the 666 case. I don't know if you've heard about it. This was the 666 case back in Tanzania, where Sam saw the house filled with ivory. And I just about fell out of my chair in that cafe. I was so excited. So that was what you would call a golden nugget. After finding out how big a deal Sharif is, Wim hung up and got on the phone with Wolf. And Wim calls me, hey man, congratulations, you did it again, you catch a big, big target. And I say, okay, man, that's what I do. Thank you. But it wasn't just that Wolf had successfully hunted another big target. He'd also unlocked a key detail about the networks dominating the ivory and rhino horn trade from Uganda to Kenya to Tanzania. Sam was interested in two networks. It was the Amaro Sharif network and the Mwaza Kroma network. So at the time, it was thought that that network was two. Meaning that Mwazu Kuroma and Amara Sharif were both wildlife trafficking kingpins, operating separately in different countries. Wim called back Sam. So I came back to Sam and I said, well, you know your, your network of Amara Sharif and Mwazu Kuroma? They're actually one. We're in it. It was a call filled with revelations. Sam and Wim were like, OK, so it seems that Kroma and Sharif are working in tandem. So how do they operate? It looks like they would source ivory and rhino horn from poachers and corrupt officials that leak the products from stockpiles. The stockpiles being big government reserves of ivory that they seize and arrest or collect from elephants that die naturally. Then it must be that they had paid off enough police, politicians and customs officers that they were able to seamlessly transport the items around the world. Wim and Sam were saying to each other, look at the evidence. Karoma and Sharif have joined forces in a kind of wildlife trafficking merger. I remember Sam saying, I don't know whether to kiss you to start doing like cartwheels because it was like, holy mackerel, this is big, that you have two people that are tied to each other and linked to the two major players and now one. It was just unbelievable that those two linked together. It was incredible. These seizures and arrests across the region that seemed unconnected finally came into focus. They were happening under the operation of Muazu Koroma and Amara Sharif. Not a single kingpin, but a two-headed snake. A syndicate that ended up being called the Enterprise. It also became clear that taking them out would be like taking out an important link in the illegal wildlife chain. We realized that this could be a worthy case, a higher level case that Fish and Wildlife's looking for on trying to shut down a, a larger syndicate. Finally, a big boss, or even better, two big bosses. But this realization coincided with Wim's retirement date from the DEA. These days, he runs his own NGO, Focused Conservation still aimed at catching wildlife traffickers. His retirement meant Sam would take over the investigation. And this is about the time Wolf and Sam came face to face for the first time. I remember sitting on the coast of Kenya in a, a rental house, or sitting on a couch, talking to Wim, and he's like, yeah, Wolf should be here any minute. I called him up, and in comes this, not to stereotype, but he looked like a big biker guy. Eventually, this newly minted team, Sam and Wolf, would do a war room-style meeting and begin to make a plan for closing in on the Enterprise in a case that could be prosecuted in an American courtroom. We were going to uh, use him to see what level Chroma Sharif were, were dealing in and what type of product, what could they get a hold of. And it's just to document a sale without creating a market, without having more animals killed. You always want to try to avoid that in a case. Sam was explaining to Wolf that he needed to get friendly with Sharif and Chroma and Mansoor and figure out what they had, like ivory and rhino horn. Then he needed to buy the product from them and have them sent to an imaginary customer in America. All this to gather evidence to eventually have them extradited to the US and prosecuted. So now we're going to buy this, direct them to do this have to think about how we're going to approach Sharif. It seemed like this might be their only shot. Karoma and Sharif so far had managed to avoid jail, despite being two of the most wanted criminals in East Africa. Wolf realised, if he blew his cover, 
If they got away, it's possible they'd never be found again. I'm going to tell you, we didn't get it. No one was going to get those guys anymore. Because the moment you try to arrest them and they run away, they're not going to sit down with any more white guy or other guy to do business with that they don't know. Okay, can you do it again, but the last bit, a bit more conversational? Mm Mm-hmm. They're not going to sit down with any more white guy or other guy to do business with Ivory that they don't know. Speaking of blowing covers, this is still something Wolf has to worry about. He's still working as an undercover informant, after all, with the US government and people like Wim. And Wolf always wants to do more big cases. He's still calling us up and going, hey, put me out there. I need to get the next big guy. You know, again, here we go. Next big guy. I want to make it. I want to do it. And part of Wim's job is to keep Wolf safe. He told us, in no uncertain terms, that if a target, someone Wolf's currently investigating, heard Wolf on this podcast, frankly, it could get him killed. And here you guys come in. You're not, you don't work in this field. Zero. Right? We do. We do this for our career. So... Not only did getting access to Wolf and his undercover tapes require months of phone calls with retired agents, meetings with risk advisors, and drafting anonymity waivers with lawyers, we were told you need to disguise Wolf's voice. Now he's got the notoriety, he's on his podcast, he loves it. At the end of the day, he does deserve it, but at the end of the day, he feels as though he's one of those invincible guys, right? He feels as though he can go into anywhere and he'll be okay. We have to kind of protect that in some ways and say, hey, listen, you're not. And these things can happen. But th- And that's why I said the simple thing is change the voice, right? So, yes. In order to protect Wolf, you've been listening to an actor voicing his exact words. Hello, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm an actor. I'm very excited to play Wolf. And I think he's an incredibly brave person. I hope I did it uh, close to the original. And that's who you'll continue to hear as we follow what happened next on Wolf's high-risk hunt. It's not a safe job they're doing. It's not at all. That's coming up on The Wildlife. So very risky. The Wildlife is a luminary original in partnership with Dream Crew, produced by Novel. It's written and hosted by me, Renaco Salina, The series is reported, written, and produced by Saskia Collette, with additional production by Julian Manigera-Patton and Jaco Tajevic. The executive producers are Maithali Rao and Max O'Brien for Novel, Coral Lee for Luminary, Drake, Adele, Future, Noor, Peter Nelson and Maggie Gilbride for Dream Crew, and Mauricio Gris and Alex Farkarson for Thread Studios. Research by Madeline Parr, Sound design mixing and scoring by David Smith. And original music composed by Jake Long. Music supervision by Nicholas Alexander. Production management by Cherie Houston and Charlotte Wolf. Fact checking by Dania Suleiman. Jamie Lines is head of creator and content operations for Luminary. The voice of Wolf is Ivan Ivashkin. Special thanks to Catherine Godfrey 